it is a pattern now of cascading failures for a great guard. It's cascading failures. This is the metaphor that I, I'm going to use now on the third uh, the third time today, on a third different show today. Now, I think there's an issue of cascading failures in the program. It's not just one thing. It's been a cascading failures. Cascading failures. I may have to revise my answer. I did not know this cascading failures. I analogy to, to a plane crash, to a plane failure that I was referring to earlier. Like, I think it's a cascading failures thing. Cascading failures. Cascading failures. Cascading failure now. I was just edumacated. And a plane goes down. That'd be cool. Cascading failures. And they're going to start trending on Badger mm -hmm. Twitter tomorrow. Oh. Cascading failures. Yeah, I hope to get dumped someday. <laughs> it's never one thing that happens on a plane. It is cascading failures. Wait till like week seven of football season. Ryan's going to be like, you know, the cascading failures. Ah. <laughs> 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 uh, Good morning, <laughs> and thank you for enjoying it with a six-pack. The Scotty Six-Pack, the only podcast talking all things Wisconsin sports with you six days a week. Uh, thank you, as always, to the guys over at Badger Notes After Dark and Ryan Herrings with Locked On Badgers. We'll link their work in the podcast description, of course, uh, for letting me take a couple of clips there that uh, you heard. As I described... The loss of Chucky Hepburn and the state of the Wisconsin basketball program and how I am currently thinking about the job security of one Greg guard as an issue of cascading failures. Um, I have a feeling that that term might get brought up in, in, that con in our conversation today that I am having with another guy from the Badger Notes Network, uh, Ryan Eilers. It does a great job covering Wisconsin football. Uh, he is in in-person correspondent these days for Wisconsin football spring practices. He also covers the wrestling program, unlike maybe anybody else in the state. Um, he really has his finger on the pulse of that program. It, it is it is quite impressive. Um, so Ryan and I are going to be talking about the state, not necessarily of the Wisconsin basketball program, not the Wisconsin football program, but college athletics as a whole, because Ryan has a perspective on this that I have come to appreciate more and more over the last few months, and one that I think Wisconsin Badgers fans are going to find very profound following the loss of Chucky Hepburn to the transfer portal. If you want to hear more talk about Wisconsin basketball, about the Wisconsin uh, basketball program, portal, Look, I have new pieces up at Badger Notes right now. Connor Siegen made a commitment to an in-conference in rival. Uh, you can find that piece up at Badger Notes that is linked in the podcast description. Uh, also, of course, you can go back to the last episode of this podcast. You can also go find the Badger Notes After Dark podcast and Lockdown Badgers, where I've done some talking in the last week. Uh, but for now, we're going to bring in Ryan Eilers to the show, and we will have an excellent conversation about NIL, the transfer portal, tampering uh, all over the place uh so ryan eilers coming up next and now we have ryan eilers joining the show of badger notes fame of badger notes after dark ryan thanks so much for joining the show feels feels good to talk to you it feels like we've been doing a lot of talking these last few days yeah for sure i always love catching up with you it seems like a lot of things were always kind of on opposite ends and i feel like uh, you make me smarter and bring me back towards the middle a little bit on a lot of things i think yeah, so I was thinking about this before we hit the record button. I was thinking about this uh, earlier yesterday, which was I, I came up in high school as a high school debater, coached high school debate for quite a long time. And there is. Oh, <laughs> You're very good at uh, it. Shows. I'm, I was going to say, I'm going to assume that's an insult. Um, it's definitely but... <laughs> not. I can definitely tell you're educated, and that's why you whoop up on me. Um, well, I appreciate it. But I the way I started to think about the conversations that you and I have and people who follow us on Twitter, um, me at Kedrick Stumbrist, Ryan at Ryan B. Eilers. Um, the way I think about those conversations, either in public or in private under DMs is that we, I feel like I end up finding a lot of room for agreement where I don't typically think, you know, at least I start to think, start at thinking we're going to get to, but we do so through this point of like, adversarial debate that I think is important, right? Not that I'm painting you as an adversary, but like we are, we come from adversarial positions that is really good for finding 
uh, common ground. And that's kind of how I got to wanting to have this conversation with you on this show was because I know you are quite disenchanted with the state of college athletics today. And it feels like that came to a head for a lot of Wisconsin Badgers fans over the weekend when Chucky Heppard entered, entered the transfer portal. When you and I had this conversation on Badger Notes After Dark, the first thing out of your mouth was, I think my fandom died today. Um, can you just explain why you why that was your initial feeling to Chucky Hepper enter, entering the transfer portal? Yeah, and I, th I think even before I answer, just to kind of like go back even just a few steps, like during that during that same episode that you were on, yeah, I mean, you kind of outlined it beautifully, and I think that's kind of gave credence to why I felt that way. Mm. Is Wisconsin has always been such a have in the portal that we've never really been gutted like that where we've lost pieces like, uh, we've lost, you know, we, we love, we love, there's a love hate relationship with Graham Mertz. You know, we love mm. Jim, Day, but we got a new wide receiver room. We love Nick Evers or Evers, but it, you know, third string scout team reps, but we've never lost a starter. And then when you see AJ leave, like we, we can go back and forth on, like, we kind of knew he was going to be gone seven schools in yeah. seven years, whatever rhetoric you want to go through. But I think I really like Chucky. And when I see that, and I'll preface with like 1 million percent, go get your money. But I think it took on such a professional league style level, or that's how it hit me. It's like, I'm an Arizona Cardinals fan, Arizona sports fan. Like tomorrow, if I'm, I'm a huge Kyler Murray guy, mm -hmm. if tomorrow, obviously they have contracts, but if tomorrow Kyler Murray just said he was leaving and he was going on, like, I would be broken. So it's like. Chucky was like that one guy, like I pointed it out many a times on the said Twitter bird um, during selection Sunday, like everyone was like, had their phones out and doing like the, you know, the, like everyone's on social media, everything has to be posted. And Chucky just sat there. He looked frustrated. He looked mad. And I was like, yeah. that's our leader. That's that guy. He doesn't want all this show. He wants to play ball. He's a killer on the floor. And it's like, it just showed that at selection Sunday. And it's like, when you lose your leader, you're like, Oh, it's, it's not about the brand. It really is about the money. And like I said, I, I don't fault him for it, but it was like, it was that reality check in my brain where I know it's not amateur. I know they should be paid. They should have been paid for decades. So we wouldn't mm -hmm. be at this point, but it was like, Oh, it, it's not about Wisconsin anymore. It's about the money. And it just, it like, like broke my spirit internally. It does feel like there's a certain innocence that's been lost over college athletics is kind of the only way that I have wrapped my head around being able to describe my feelings about it because I think they all deserve to get paid. This, this is free labor that is generating with a B as in butthole billion dollar television contracts. And for the people who are doing that labor to not get a cut of it is absurd. Right. And I think there's no disagreement from either of us on that, of course. Um, what I then struggle with is those same feelings that you're describing, right? Is where, why do I feel like this, this person owes a loyalty to the team that I care about most, right? And it is because th there has been some semblance of an innocence over, over college sports that we are now finally having to grapple with. We, I always talk about the fact that, you know, the shoes ran the sport for however long they did, right? We have NIL today only because multiple Adidas employees went to federal prison over paying college basketball players. But now with it out in the open, there is still just something that doesn't feel quite right about it that I just really struggle to put the, my, my finger on quite what it is. And I don't know if you know what that is. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I think that in a sense, I get what you're saying. I see, I feel like, I feel like a lot of times we just hide behind language. Like we, like mm. we love to cover certain, we like to call certain things. I mean, it's a societal thing too. Like we're going to both look at the same thing and call it something different. Um, like when we talk about innocence, like, and it's, and it's scrolling across the bottom is it amateurism. Like it's only an amateurism in name only, right. uh, college sports haven't been amateurism since the invention of college sports. Someone was always getting paid at every turn or not at every turn, but at most turns, 
there's conferences that are built south of us that have been doing this in all sports for so long that it's like it's almost a handshake agreement that they never tattled on each other until it's became fair and then like you can see the infighting within some of that conference but i think for me like when you, when you talk about like the the innocence like they owe the loyalty and it's just like i feel like that was one thing that was like mm-hmm. that college could always have that the professional sports couldn't because it's for professional sports like you kind of know it's a mercenary business you just kind of accept like hey they're on two to three year contracts your favorite player could get cut tomorrow and that's why they're getting paid millions and millions of dollars but now it's kind of like we're living it like we we like speaking of language we love to share this idea that's like the wild wild west well i'm a parent of two kids and i look at it like we we always use these terms kids like we have to protect the kids yeah. the kids should make money these are the same kids they can buy cigarettes they can go to war they can do all the things so this idea and make millions of dollars for their name image and likeness and pay to play like i think we have to get away from using the terms kids like for lack of better terms these are young adults men and women mm-hmm. across all of college sports that are finally getting paid for their name image and likeness but i think when you look at it absence regulation this is going to just it's a cluster because i have two kids if i went into a candy store and said hey you have been good you've done all the work your mom and i have asked all week for your allowance why don't you guys all go pick out some candy if I didn't tell them that they can't have the whole store, what kind of parent am I? So when we have these young people going into the NIL marketplace, when they have people tampering with them throughout the season, a la AJ store have people Mm -hmm. confirmed, have reached out to him in the middle of the season. Mm -hmm. How are we supposed to educate these kids on how to navigate it? At the end of the day, everyone's trying to use them like it's a meat market and they're trying to navigate it their best. But, to flip it to even football for a second, you look at someone like Leon Lowry, who is getting taken advantage of an NIL agent. Mm. How, who are they supposed to turn to for resources? The NI, or the NCAA, I always call, and I and I think Jason Brown from Last Chance U said this, and I've like regurgitated it for the last few years. The NCAA stands for Non Caring A Holes of America, <laughs> and it's like that just shows now, like with the transfer, they change the transfer rules that you can transfer and play as much as you want every every court case they have to try to like hold some kind of regulation for sports gets denied in federal court and it's just like for me it just seems like not only is the innocence gone the amateurs gone it seems like all the sports are about gone this is the the point that you you you're getting at with leon lowry that i think is the hardest part of this conversation which is that we can acknowledge that it's not kids right these are young adults, 18, 19, you know, in some cases up to what, 24 years old. Um, yeah. Um, Jack, I'm sure Jack Golke is going to be working down the street for me at Northwestern mutual any day now. Um, but there is still some room for learning for growth with, you know, people of that age. And that means the model that currently exists where, a Leon Lowry who has transferred to Wisconsin to play football at Wisconsin now, you know, was committed to Wisconsin at one point, quickly uncommitted. And the saga goes that a, a an agent to handle his name, image, and likeness dealings said you should decommit because we can find you more money elsewhere. Turned out that guy was, you know, not... I don't want to say that he was completely full of crap, um, but it appears that... He, he did not earn the trust of Leon Lowry because Leon Lowry quickly parted ways with him. Um, there are actors like that out now who can operate with impunity because nobody has to report any numbers. These agents don't have to report any numbers. They can take whatever cut that they want to, and they can tell one kid that they took 5% and tell another kid that they need to take 10%. It's completely gone by the wayside where, at least in professional sports, we do have protection for the athletes in terms of a labor union, in terms of agreements that have to be met and for actual agents. Um, And I think that's the biggest thing missing 
at least now, if we're going to say like amateurism, the ruse of it to protect chill, to protect the kids, right? That's gone and deserves to be gone. But there is room to actually protect these student athletes now that under the current model simply isn't there. And I think we at least need to come to a point in the model of collegiate athletics where there is more room for, you know, protection of this giant, giant class of, of, I mean, athletes who are paid laborers, essentially. And I don't know exactly what that right model is because unionizing under, you know, this kind of workforce is incredibly difficult. But I, I want to know if at least you agree you agree or disagree, is there some role for, if not the NCAA, at least for some organization to do something more to protect athletes in college now? I mean, if someone has a conscience, I would imagine that there needs mm -hmm. some be something. Um, yeah, I mean, there, there's got to be some kind of regulatory body. Like, we have it at every, at every level, um, whether it's as effective as as, as a peer that I mean, remains to be seen because the NFL, you have, like you said, the NFL, the NFL PA, they vet all their agents. Like you, you could not pass a check and your agents not allowed to do business mm -hmm. um, with the NFL. I think the thing, and, and, and I don't want to segue away from this topic because I like it, but I think getting back to like more of the, the amateurism thing. And I think yeah. like the regulatory body where I feel that my college fandom died and, and, I, and I still, I'm always going to root for the Badgers. So you got to take me like a, a big old hot bag. Yeah, there's the part of this where it's like, oh, I hate this. I don't know if I can watch college basketball anymore. And then on the, yeah. you know, first first, first Monday night, first Monday night in April, you know what I'm going to be doing? I'm going to be watching the national title game every year. Absolutely. I'm going to be in my medium shirt that doesn't fit. So <laughs> like ready to root on the boys or girls, depending on which team I'm watching. But yeah. I think the thing that, that terrifies me about the whole thing is like, you look at the NFL and you outline nicely, like they have contracts, they have regulatory bodies, they have collective bargaining. You're even seeing it at the high school level now where mm. like WIA is the Wisconsin inter intercollegiate or interathletic association. Basically the regulatory body for Wisconsin athletes is holding a, they either held a vote or holding a vote to give NIL to high schoolers. And they would follow suit, I believe with Florida and Texas and Ohio mm -hmm. and other States to allow this. So I start to look at it like, on, on a ticker on the bottom, it says, is college amateurism dead? I think you could ask the question, is all of amateurism dead? Because at some level, we used to, I personally, I guess I'll just speak for myself because it's just my opinion, my opinion only, not supported <laughs> by Kedrick or any of his affiliates. But at, at some level, I, and, and you know, I've had, you and I have had conversations offline talking about you love AAA, and I love AAA too, and like AA, and all these different, like farm systems, like we love, mm -hmm. we love the construct of sports. Baseball, right. AAA baseball, minor league it's baseball. 100%. Yep. But I think all sports are going to be moving into that model because at the end of the day, if your high school players are getting paid, your college players are getting paid, and your NFL or your pro sports teams, pro sports teams are getting paid, at some level, you college is AAA, your high school is your AA, your uh, AAU teams or whatever is essentially your single because they're paying for players too. They yeah. always have. Yeah, like that's kind of your single A and you kind of filter your way up the, the best ones move on to the next professional league. And I feel like that that that's fine. And I think it's it's it the players should be paid if someone is going to I've always looked at it like because I because I did struggle with this for a long time because I'm always I, I've been that person. I'm 37. I've been that person that like had like the 97 year old old man views where it's like you get a scholarship that should be enough. <laughs> But then, like you hear people, t and I and I have uh, some really good friends that played for the Badgers and played in the NFL that I've talked to about this, like over beers, where they kind of let it fly, and it's just like you only got twelve hundred dollars stipend. Like, and mm -hmm. and to, to someone listening to this, that might sound awesome, a twelve hundred dollar a month. It's like, but you're bringing in millions of dollars for the well, university. The problem I've always had with like the you get a scholarship conversation too is it's like, okay, there are plenty of other people who also get scholarships. You know what they don't have to do? Commit 40 plus hours a, a week of their life to play football, to play a a, a a sport that guarantees you're going to get head, head injuries. And whether it's football, whether it's volleyball, whether it's hockey, like these athletes have to put in tremendous amount of hours into that on top of school, right? And, you know, there's the 
severing school conversation that I think we should work our way around to eventually. But I think you're you're working yourself into into a, another good point there, which is talking about how we can think about the the big four sports leagues, the NFL, NBA, NHL, MLB as you know, prime sports. Also, then collegiate sports are something like AAA all the way down to AAU being something like single A, whatever we look at it as. And the point you're getting at there is that college sports really aren't all that different from professional sports anymore. Um, I think you're even seeing this in the eyes of some writers in the Badgers beat who have very slowly come to this realization. I think um, some more, more slowly than others ha have lately been like, this, this whole transfer portal saga this year has finally taught me that, you know, nothing's off the table. This is all pro sports. Now people, interesting people who I think are smart, who are coming to this realization, I think slow more slowly than I would have expected them to. Um, but it makes me ask the question then, right? If this isn't different than professional sports, like, does it have to be like, why, why should it be? Is it important for it to be, Ryan? Is it important, and not even necessarily from a philosophical standpoint, I take it from a your fandom standpoint. Does it matter for you for college sports to be something different than the pros? I think it has to at some at some level because that was its allure. Because you you can't you can't say truthfully when you watch on Saturdays all day like a glutton, what you know, mm. rest rest in peace to the Pac 12 after dark. You can't like sit there and watch 12 hours of football as a glutton and say that's the best product you can see. Mm -hmm. Because when you're if you're watching pro for pro, then I would like to see people make the same argument that why would you wait until fall to watch the NFL when you could watch the XFL this Saturday? But you're not watching because they're not the best players in the world. And I think you could say the same thing about college. Now, if you look at the Big Ten and the SEC, like a lot of those are gonna eventually make it to the men's league and like you're gonna see a lot of them, but a lot of them you're not. Mm -hmm. So you're, you're watching your future accountants, your future engineers, your future salespeople. Like, I think college had a niche. And, and my, my concern for it, where I say that it has to be different, because I think this idea, and someone had to, uh, sent this to me um, on the app, for, as you would like to say, the app formerly, formerly known as Twitter, and uh, it, it, it caught fire is if... The, the, if the Wisconsin on the chest no longer means much more than the, and, and I'm a butcher this analogy, so I'm this yeah. is a, half, a half paraphrase, but if it's, if the Wisconsin logo on the front, isn't going to mean anything as much as like the Motorola logo on the Milwaukee right. Bucks Jersey, you're going to lose a lot of your fan base. And I, and I, and I say that, and I'm not trying to be an extremist. I just think your alumni are still going to care, but full disclosure, I'm a whitewater, I'm a whitewater grad. But I love the Badgers. I've had mm -hmm. friends play for the Badgers. But at the end of the day, if – and I think if I try to circle it back, I think there's somebody that's in the Badger beat community, uh, semi-retired, if you if you follow where I'm going with this one, <laughs> um, self-proclaimed semi-retired. And I'm, I, I never thought I would come around, but I finally – I think I finally figured out this person's niche because – they always bang the drum like you have to get in state guys. You have to get in state guys. And I've always been on Luke Fickle's side, or even Greg Yard for that matter, getting a lot of players from Minnesota. That I don't care where the players come from. I want them to to love playing here and to ball out. But I think when you get to this point where it's so transient with the transfer portal, and everyone's here like as literally as a as a paid employee at some level, like is you know little the little kids up in Northern Wisconsin, Southern Wisconsin, are they going to feel that tie to the university if they don't have their hometown heroes? And I feel like I finally figured out that that, that person that's been banging that state drum is trying to, and I'm not going to speak for him, but it almost feels like he, he wants to keep that connective tissue because ultimately if it we're just the Wisconsin Badgers and name only, and I, like, for, like, like I said, like I'm a whitewater grad, why can't I be a Minnesota? And that burns my soul to say, <laughs> but, but like, let's say for instance, I, I live in Middleton now, a suburb of Madison. We, we got a kid torn pet away. Just great kid, great young man, great family lives right down the street, decided to go to Minnesota. If I like watching Torin play at Otto Breitenbach stadium, and I really want to follow him. Mm -hmm. What is my tie to be a Badgers fan as a whitewater grad when I can go support the goofers and support a kid that I know, because it, this, 
that's just name only. You're not supporting the state. You're not representing the state. You're just in, you're just a triple A of NFL affiliate. I like this point. This is a point that I had not thought of before. Um, and the, the idea of in-state recruiting being really important to generate fandom, um, for. Cause not everybody and, can go to Wisconsin, like right. an alumni. So you have, right. to have a connective somewhere. Yeah. I, I hadn't thought of this before and I almost wonder, but like you say, you're a whitewater grad. I almost wonder if it comes from like my own place of being an alumnus of the university, right. Where I hadn't even totally thought about the, the other value in even, even though that's how I grew up, right. I didn't grow up an alum of the university. I didn't, neither of my parents went to the university. Nobody in my family went to the university, but I grew up as a fan because it's the state school and that those other recruiting ties being important into saying like, Hey, it's a big deal when the university of Wisconsin comes to recruit a kid on, on your high school campus. Um, and that being able to generate fans that are outside of just that kid's family, it's fans within that kid's high school graduation class. It's that kid's siblings and, and their friends. Um, I think that's a really intriguing point and an important point where I cared a lot more about college athletics after I got to the University of, of Wisconsin. Before I actually enrolled, I was way more of a professional sports fan than a college sports fan. And I think today that has genuinely flipped um, where like now when I watch the NFL, like I watch the Packers. I don't really watch a ton outside of the NFC North. Um, when it comes to college football, I'll watch basically anything I want. Now, uh, I will say that the recent C uh, college football playoff snub of Florida State may have uh, eh, rubbed me the wrong way a little bit on, on college football. Yeah, uh, this conversation is all about money anyway. But that that tie, that tie, whether it be your local community or you as an alumnus, is important in some way where if we get to the point where these athletes aren't students necessarily, uh, maybe there's a, a track where these athletes are students and they get their scholarship and that's it. Or there's a track where they are not students, but can make money anywhere, anywhere else. Um, what will that do for your interest in watching the sport? If we get to a model in which the, the universities and their athletic departments are used, you know, primarily for licensing deals rather than having the athletes truly be affiliated with the universities. Well, I think that would actually be the final nail in the coffin mm. uh, for, for the sport in general, not necessarily for my fandom, because I feel like mine's kind of on the rocks as it is. Um, because I, th I think like I, I'm always someone that has like can never just settle with surface area things. So my brain is one that like I'm going to keep exploring how bad something can get. I like to call it deliberate planning. So it's like I'm prepared for every situation. So like in that model right there, I would pose your question back to you. So if we go back and we have, and like, if they're just scholarships that first of all, that's never going to happen. Like <laughs> that's a great idea. But then like at some level there, we're going to have to have a, a legitimate minor league. And yeah. then like FCS is that, that model that you're talking about or D2 or D2. Mm. I think the thing is if you, if they don't have to be a student anymore, what is, and this is a rhetorical question. So no, fair. but if they don't have to be a student anymore, what is the one thing that doesn't matter anymore? Eligibility. So if you don't have eligibility, why can't a 30 year old play? You know what I mean? And then at, at that level, if you have, let's say for instance, you know, you try, cause at some level you're not going to have to worry about a draft. Like we could literally have Jack Cohn back two years from now, slinging the pill for the boys. And it's like, well, why doesn't he Quintess Cephas, you know, set, made some bad decisions with uh, some gambling uh, for the, why can't we get the, the band back together? Mm. Why can't we, you know, get Taiwan deal? You know, he, he I've seen him on Instagram recently, he's still in great shape. Bri uh, if you've seen Bryson Williams, former defensive tackle from Nebraska, he looks like Mr. Olympus. 
get him back on the defensive line. You got Jack Cohn and Quintez Cephas out there. Let's get the band back together. Because if you don't have eligibility, then you're literally, and I and this is the same phrase I say all the time. So forgive me if you've tired if you're tired of hearing it. But if you get to that model, you literally are just the XFL with a student section and bands. Is that bands with a Z or bands with a trombone? Um. <laughs> with an, with an F, like you know your normal bands. Um, the the one place I'd push back on is eligibility. To me, isn't a question of the the scholarship necessarily, and because we are already pretty arbitrarily coming up with a a four year four year number for eligibility. I think there's a really good chance that we get to a place where as long as you're enrolled in a graduate program, I mean, what we were, we were at a spot where like you, you get the one guy at Alabama every year under Nick Saban, who's enrolled in one graduate level class so that he can technically be a graduate assistant for, for the tide. Right. What, what is stopping this model from being something like, like what is eligibility if not just another movement restriction that's been struck down by the courts time and time again over against the NCAA where if somebody has real earning potential to earn more in college than they do at the NFL level right let's let's take a um who who is uh who's who's coming out from Oregon right now oh who played at Auburn whose name is escaping Bo, me Bonix yes Bo, Bonix you're not telling me that Bo Nix over the next five years could make way more money playing five more years of college football than he, than he could in the NFL. Like there's a lawsuit waiting to happen there where guys, as long as you can have them enrolled in, I don't know, a doctorate program, that's like a, a PhD program is going to be the yeah. ticket. That's a five, six year program. Right. What's stopping us from getting to, to that point again, a rhetorical question. And I, I was having this conversation with, um, another listener of the show during the first weekend of the NCAA tournament. And they were very put off by the idea of just licensing agreements toward the universities and just having the, the university be basically an in name only association with the football team, with the basketball team. But they were like, if you know, they, they are still in school at whatever program that might be, you want to have a 30 year old playing then fine. Like so be it. And, and, I don't know. Maybe that's the happy medium we need to come to. I'm really not. I'm really not sure. Um, Ryan, before we we close up here, because I, I don't want to keep you too late, th there is uh, Zach Heilprin, uh for the Zone in Madison. He his line always on the transfer portal on NIL in the weird place we are now, where the fact that we have had new freedom of movement along with the ability for players to get paid all of that coming to a head all at once has created this really messy era that will eventually change but it's, i'm just not sure where it's going to head to zach halloran's line is always like i don't care where this ends up just get me to the end of it get me to whatever the model is that we need to get to and then we'll figure it out from that point are you do you think about this in a similar vein or is that and, and I take it that your answer to this is yes, or is what the end result is to all of this really important to you? And if so, do you have any particular desired end result in mind? I don't, I don't know that my end result is ever going to come true. And I, because essentially you can't put anything back in Pandora's box. Yeah. Um, but no, I, I agree with Zach. Like, just get me to the end. I think the I think the six, what is it? The 600 pound gorilla that no one wants to talk about is behind every monetary decision and uh, financial choice within, you know, with the transfer portal, all of this, I think the thing that a lot of people might not be talking about, and, you know, I'm just, I'm literally three screws from being crazy myself. So maybe this is just me, but the more I poke around on things, the more I'm terrified because if to your point, which I believe is a real, a real, uh, possibility where they go to like kind of just name and name and licensing mm. what is going to stop private equity from getting involved yeah i think that's the big that that is you, you are right that that is the big 600 pound gorilla and that might even be putting putting it lightly in here and, and private equity is already poking around at the florida state athletic department I, they, they are inviting private equity in there which is 
I mean, the like leopards eating my eating your own face of all leopards eating your own faces. Private equity is ruining car washes, man. Like, oh, this is yeah. There, there is a real point where investor capitalism like destroy. If you don't like college sports now, you are going to hate it when investor capitalism gets its hands on it. But not only that, but you have to think of all the people that are now going to be bought and paid for. Like, yeah. like, like from a, from a very myopic or microscopic view, when we look at like Wisconsin, if you think Chris McIntosh is making the, any decisions about any coach from now on, he, he is the Roger Goodell. He is, he's going to bring you the bad or good news, but he is not making any decisions because if private equity gets in there and they want X, Y, or Z to be the coach, X, Y, or Z is going to be the coach. Qualicate qualifications be damned because how are you going to tell them no when they can literally pull your entire financial yeah. portfolio away? Well, and that's where you get into the like similar conversations about meddling NFL owners, NBA owners, things like that, right? Where it, you it, have a it, lot it, of David Teppers out there. Yeah. Um, and part of why, you know, I, I think Packers fans in particular are so proud to say like, we don't have, we don't have a bungling owner to, to mess with that. And maybe that is, maybe, maybe that is the kind of innocence that we, we have all really enjoyed about collegiate athletics is that they're, they're for so long have not been these shadowy figures, at least operating where we can see them, um, taking, taking big swipes at something that we've enjoyed for so long, where we, we know that they at least meddle in some of these other pro sports teams. Um, I, I want to finish by circling back around to the Chucky Hepburn conversation for just a second and, and talk about Wisconsin in the world of it being a, a have and have not, because for, for so long, I think we've been able to avoid this conversation as Badgers fans. Not that Wisconsin fans haven't had a, a conversation similar to this. We've all, you know, murmured about, about how we don't love NIL and the transfer portal, things like that. Um, but it has really come to a head here because Wisconsin has kept everybody that they've ever wanted in the portal basically until now. And now that that has changed, I think we're entering a very different era of talking about the portal. Um, as Wisconsin fans, at least, you know, so does something where, you know, last two football off seasons have been really fun. A lot of part in that due to the transfer portal does, does something like this past week really, um, you know, put a damper on, on those feelings, or are you still going to continue to celebrate it as, as is for now? I, I think trying to stay positive, I, I have to celebrate it as is. Um, I, I think part of why, like getting back to your point where you said that like Wisconsin fans had been benefited from the transfer portal and not really been taken. I wonder if that is more of an indictment of the rosters the coaches have built though, mm. because Chucky, I mean, we know for the last few years have been getting offers to leave and he's been by far one of our best players. AJ, no one can doubt he's one of the, like was getting tampered with in the middle of the season. I, I find that to be more of an indictment on, on both, you know, my beloved Paul Christ and, you know, I've, I've had a tough time with Greg Gard, uh, never called for his job, but I always question what success looks like, but he even like no coach is going to be successful if all your best players can leave. Like you, it's impossible to the idea of, to think of, recruiting for your future team and recruiting your current team and then trying to obtain high end talent unless you just have a brink struck behind you. Yeah. So I think I, I got to celebrate the wins because I know I'm going to be sad about the losses. So I think that's part of it is like, if we do start getting guys in here, like I, I, I'm nervous, like we have already seen Nick Evers transfer for football, but as fickle begins to grow that program, and as, you know, guard gets Daniel Freetag in here, which gets you someone who loves coach guard the way Daniel Freetag loves him, because <laughs> that is some the most pure and innocent love I, from one man to another. And it's just, it's wonderful. But if he's on all Big Ten NBA or all Big Ten team, you know, he's, you know, 12 points, five assists a game. It, I, I imagine he wants to stay at Wisconsin, but are you going to want to like hold your breath for two portal and two portal cycles a year for the next four years. Like it's, it's terrifying. 
It is. Um, I, I hope we get to a place where we have contracts, something that looks like more stability than we have now, because I think if it's not innocence, if it's not uh, a fear of private equity, it's at least stability that I think we are all missing in college athletics today. And I think your, your line about, you know, celebrate the wins as you get them because the losses are going to hurt is just tells me <laughs> this is just the same as it is for the rest of the way we cheer about everything else in sports, basically. Um, <laughs> so Ryan, I want to thank you very much for, for jumping on the show. Uh, do you have anything you, you would like to tell people to go ahead and follow? Uh, because as I said, at the top of the show, before you got on here, one of the things I admire about the work you do is the work that you do for uh, covering the wrestling program. One of the unsung heroes of the Wisconsin athletic department for sure. Um, so if you are a wrestling fan, a Wisconsin Badgers wrestling fan or big 10 wrestling, Ryan is a quintessential follow because he covers the, he covers the Badgers program as good, if not better than anybody else in the state, frankly. Well, thank you for that. I don't, I don't know if I necessarily believe that because there's a lot of, a lot of great people and I'm just a stooge with a platform. So <laughs> I, I love coming on. Thanks for having me on. You know, we love going back and forth and I, and I love talking ball with you. Uh, thanks. That is Ryan. Follow him. Ryan B Eilers E I L E R S on the website, formerly known as Twitter. And uh, we'll be back talking to you all very soon. Thanks Ryan. That's Ryan Eilers of Badger notes after dark fame of the website, formerly known as Twitter fame as my, my antagonist to my, my, my takes on Greg Gard fame. Uh, I, I really love, love talking with Ryan because he, he and I disagree about a lot of things, but we can have that conversation in, in a productive way. It's that adversarial debate that is really important, right? You are, you are not my enemy. You are my adversary in this conversation uh, that like, I don't know, uh, bad, bad sports talk shows uh, completely, completely butcher. Uh, so really glad to have Ryan on the show. We're, we're going to keep talking on the feed this week. Lots of Bucks playoff stuff coming up. Uh, we'll probably preview game two on tomorrow's show because that game two will be on Tuesday. And Damian Lillard just single-handedly destroyed uh, the Indiana Pacers in game one. So we'll keep talking all things Badgers, Packers, Brewers, Bucks, and beyond here on the Scotty Six Pack Podcast. While you're here, leave a review, five stars, kind comments. Really, really does help the show. And we will all talk to you again very, very, very soon. Until then, on Wisconsin.